because the CPU runs the drivers. But let's see why this is. When building a custom PC, you most likely had to install drivers, usually for the graphics card. Not only that, keyboards, Wi-Fi cards, and even USB ports also require drivers. Without them, your computer won't be able to do anything with them. But what are they? Let us first observe the hardware of a typical computer. This is a central processing unit. Its purpose is to follow and execute instructions. You might have heard of x86. This is a CPU architecture that specifies a list of instructions it can execute as well as what interfaces it can interact with. Then there is random access memory. It serves as short term memory for the CPU and usually stores program code and data. Lastly are the peripherals or external devices. This includes devices like hard drives for long term memory, Wi-Fi, USB, and graphics cards. These devices need interfaces like SATA and PCIe in order to communicate directly with the CPU. And what proceeds is the operating system. An OS, like Windows or Mac OS, serves to organize and abstract the computer's resources. But in order to accomplish that, we need drivers. And so, drivers are software that provide an interface to peripherals. A device like a graphics card are too complex to use on its own, but a driver hides all of the inner workings and provides a list of the most important commands that the operating system can use. Nice. To demonstrate the use of drivers, I have an interesting example, so for that let's go small and use a TNC 4.0 board, which is basically an Arduino on steroids. Before we move on though, I want to let you know that the TNC has many things similar to a PC. Just like in a typical computer, the TNC has a CPU formerly known as the microcontroller, that executes programs you write it to. And it has interfaces such as SPI and I2C, which are analogous to a PC's PCI and SATA connections, in order to interact with external devices. We are going to pair it up with an ILI 9341 LCD module. It is a basic display with a resolution of 240 by 320 and it has a color depth of 16 bits per pixel. In order to connect it to the TNC board, I'm going to use some jumper wires and a breadboard. There are pins called CLK, MISO, and MOSI. There are two channels for data to tunnel through. MOSI is for sending zero data from the TNC to the screen, and MISO is for receiving data. Lastly, the CLK pin is used for synchronizing the data transfers between the two devices. Okay, the setup is now ready. If I try to power it on, the screen lights up, but there's no image shown. Of course, the reason is that we haven't programmed it yet. Before programming, however, let's figure out how the workflow of displaying an image to the screen will go. I will utilize a module I made called UIR that can draw rectangles, gradients, and text onto the screen. So to start, we need to create a canvas that the UIR module can draw to. Next. I'm going to use an open source driver developed by Vindar for the LCD module. This driver will be set up to initialize the module and make it ready to transfer the canvas onto the screen. So in the Arduino IDE, I'm going to import my UIR rendering module, the font for rendering text and the LCD driver. Then I'll make it allocate space for the canvas and initialize the driver module using the set canvas. Next. Using my UIR module, I'll make clear the canvas to black, then draw some text. Finally, with one line of code, update the screen using the canvas it drawed onto. After uploading the code, whoops, I gotta fix those errors. Okay, we can see that the module's working by displaying some text on the top left of the screen. As you can see, the driver made transferring to the canvas to the screen very easy. And being that it is programmed for the specific device, it is also efficient at doing its job despite the SPI bus lacking speed. If we look on the contrary, using the screen without the driver is very cumbersome. There is a lot of technical stuff that one needs to do in order for it to work. For instance, I need to send this arbitrary list of commands to the screen just to initialize it. And additionally, we need to note the list of commands and data types the LCD module can receive. 
On top of that, I need to know the timing patterns of the SBI bus and program the TNC for it to send it properly. So the contrast made it clear that the driver packages all that functionality and into use in into an AT. Oh crap, what the heck? Into an easy to use library so that we can focus on more important tasks. Such as making a stopwatch application in my DIY phone project. Which, by the way, is a reason to subscribe if you want to see a video about making this device in the future. Anyways, while it might seem that the driver needs a lot of code for it to work on our project, programmers do appreciate the abstraction of all the complexity so that they don't have to go down a rabbit hole just to get the screen to work. So as you might understand by now, the CPU is what runs the drivers. A hypothetical CPU that needs a driver to run will be paradoxical. The CPU would need the driver for it to process instructions, but then the driver needs to be executed by the CPU, but then the CPU needs the driver... Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Coming to that agreement, there are some misconceptions. For instance, there are some CPUs that have an integrated GPU on the same die. AMD, for example, have a lineup of Ryzen processors that have both a CPU and an integrated GPU, which they call APUs. Processors like these don't need a discrete graphics card and can be run on its own. However, the integrated GPU does need a graphics driver, just like a regular GPU, which can trigger this misconception since it is mixed with the CPU. But what about the BIOS? Indeed, BIOSes are critical for a PC's operation, however, it is just firmware for the hardware on the motherboard. Since motherboards are made differently by each manufacturer, they need a BIOS to standardize the inputs and outputs of the hardware like the chipset chip and SATA functionality. The CPU is still the one that executes the BIOS. Lastly, there are software out there like Oracle's VirtualBox that are designed to emulate an entire machine. One could argue that this software is a driver for the CPU since it can process instructions for a virtual machine. This is useful for emulating a CPU of a different architecture like ARM on a typical x86 CPU. I'd say this is a stretch to call it a driver since it is all virtual. Alright, so thanks for watching my video. If you have enjoyed it, give subscribe button a whirl. Later guys. Cut, cut, cut.